And actually it was like, a, it was sort of tabula rasa really for all the artists. It gave them all the same starting point from which they then went off into their different areas to make different kinds of work. Um, and just to give you a kind of sense of the, all the different kinds of projects that emerged out of this, Susan Hiller uh, began with what she calls deep research, and I'll read you something she wrote in a minute, um, where she researched the history of the Jews in Bristol. And it was at the time when she was making this new project uh, called the J Street Project in Germany, where she filmed every street or alley in Germany, 360 of them, with the word Jude in it. So she was very interested in the history of Jews within particular locations or cities. And after doing that research, she then went away to Berlin, and we didn't see her until the installation period. And in fact, what she did was made a work where she researched the representation of Jews in cinema from the 1920s to the present day. And she made this remarkable work, which is two screens, um, collage piece of, uh, if you know Susan Hill's work, it was um, very emotive, um, sort of cutting from one time period to the next in terms of a stereotype. Uh, we showed it in, these, uh, li in this li listed building called the Castle Vaults, which actually looks like a public toilet. It's the only bit of the castle left, um, and it had never been used before for a, an art exhibition. Um, and uh, it, was, it was remarkable because what she picked up on was that this area of Bristol is rather like a no-man's land. So you emerged out of this video installation, which was highly emotive and uh, quite troubling, into an area which is, you know, has a kind of lot of people sitting, drinking out of cans and feeling a bit lost, and a, a sense in which this was on the edge of the city centre. And it was shown at a time at which Bristol had had a lot of problems with backlashes against the Muslim community. So it was a real sense in which, you know, we carry around with us, all of us, these stereotypes in our subconscious. Um, and then I flip through to uh, Silke Otto Knapp, who is the painter, who had never worked to commission before. She's studio-based, a painter. And she researched uh, Humphrey Repton, who's a landscape gardener within Bristol, you may know of, uh, who was really a follow-on from Capability Brown. He was particularly interested in the artificiality um, uh, stroke sort of nature debate and was particularly interested in, in, in landscapes that would look as if they had always been there. And this was a case in which, just to show you, if you can, this is Silke hanging on the paintings, but if you can see there, these kind of lush watercolour gouache paintings which have these fantastical landscapes which were built up from a series of photographs she had taken of gardens in and around Bristol, but you won't recognise a bit of Bristol at all. Um, but she decided to show them in this place called the Custom House on Queen Square. And Queen Square is this Georgian square within Bristol. It used to have a dual carriageway running through it until 1999 when it was returned to being a Georgian square. So there's a real sense in which you, you, you're kind of, um, you lose your sense of orientation because uh, you imagine it has always been there. And I think Silke, again, you know, went through this research process and yet... Um, there was a sense in which she want, just wanted a light, airy space. We, we did a certain amount to the spaces and the buildings, which is always part of the curatorial responsibility, taking up carpets and blinds and all the rest of it. She didn't want any electric light, so it was just lit by daylight throughout the day, so they shifted and changed. And we uh, painted this back wall dark green to really kind of, so they really resonated. It was almost like a sort of museum environment. Another artist called Joao Penalva, who um, is a filmmaker, uh, uh, creates uh, film video installations. And uh, again, one of our great fears was that somehow the Clifton Suspension Bridge would appear in one of the works. So when he said he was interested in the uh, sort of urban myths surrounding Clifton Suspension Bridge, I was like, oh, no. Um, but actually... Um, it was very interesting. Picture this moving image, work with us on this project. And um, we had film crews on either side of the bridge and on a boat and underwater film cameraman filming the bed of the river. 
And Joao creates these kind of fantastical video installations, uh, which weave stories around uh, a, a factual history. And um, his video installation intersped uh, footage uh, from the filming with this narrative, which was uh, essentially from a story about somebody called um, Marianne Henley, who threw herself off Clifton Suspension Bridge in the 1840s and was saved because the wind caught her skirts and she floated down. So Joao created this fairy tale around this princess who takes this journey diving off this bridge and into the underworld. Um, and we converted um, a market hall, which was uh, just kind of concrete floor, into a cinema. So there's a real sort of sense of coming out through the markets and into the cinema in the middle of nowhere. Nathan Coley, um, I don't want to go into too much detail on them. I want to leave some time for discussion, but Nathan um, is someone, in contrast to the other three, chose his site right at the beginning. And you could see his as a site-specific piece in that he knew where he wanted to make it for, but it, it has since resonated elsewhere. Um, this was a churchyard closed to the public since uh, 1910. And uh, it been, hasn't been deconsecrated. It was cons consecrated in the 1830s. But it's curious for Nathan because um, it's been preserved from corporate development because it's consecrated land. So uh, all around it has been built on, uh, as near to it as you can possibly get, and it's sort of this piece of green within the city centre. And uh, Nathan built this piece here, which this is, uh, you can see the difference. <laughs> One was research in February and this was in May. Um, and he created this three-dimensional uh, to scale model of a generic housing block in Glasgow. And it's very much a, a sculptural piece that kind of resists um, the landscape in which it's put in, res resists the sort of sense of the picturesque and plays with the shapes of the tombs around it. It's sort of TARDIS-like in the sense that it just appears um, in, in that space. But of course, what was part of what Nathan was doing was he opened up the churchyard, people had access to it, they came and ate their sandwiches in it. And a lot of the reaction from the public initially was... Well, I don't like it. You know, it's kind of not beautiful. It's resisting. It's it's difficult work. It doesn't tell me much. But then, the longer they spent with it, the more they saw it kind of echoing some of the forms around it, and actually bringing up the question of who is this space for, who owns this space, who values this space, how are our cities developed, um, how do we decide what goes in and what doesn't, and uh, this is it shown as part of Free's Art Fair a few months later, where it was sited in Regent's Park, which I felt was um, less, how do I put it, um, less resolved, in that it was a sort of sculpture trail a bit, so you sort of felt like it was plonk, plonk, plonk. There was Julian Opie's cars sort of behind you over there, and it was just a little bit like it was another sculptural piece as opposed to, but it did reflect quite nicely off the architecture behind it. 